Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Antero for uh, accepting this invitation to participate in the webinar. I have to say that uh, I have a long uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Antero, and which is active in the field of radiopharmaceuticals uh, design and preclinical evaluation studies. So Antero uh, is, uh, has a degree in biochemistry from the University of Coimbra in Portugal, as you all know. It's the, one of the oldest universities in Europe. Then he made the PhD uh, under the supervision of Professor Terry Jones, already thinking to have one with background to start running the cyclotron that was installed thereafter in Coimbra. And exactly now, it was a successful story in the sense that uh, Antero is now the director of ICNAS. ICNAS is the acronym that stands for Portuguese, uh, it stands for Institute of Nuclear Sciences for Health Applications. And Antero now is the, the director of, of this uh, institute that I will uh, explain a little bit more later on what is the, the main activities that developed there. Uh, and uh, the Antero research interests are uh, in the field of uh, molecular imaging, PET, SPECT, focus on radiopharmaceutical development, PET, radiochemistry and radiopharmacy quality control, and then preclinical imaging and clinical trials. So as you, as you can imagine, it's really a multidisciplinary and Excited field with it's, it's uh, a science with evident applications in health and impacting society. And related with that, uh, Antero promoted the start of three spin offs companies from the University of Coimbra that are involved in the TARC tree, one of them, uh, for, radiomedic, for the production of uh, radioactive metals and he holds uh, several patents in this topic. So, Ignis is the main producer in Portugal of radio pharmaceuticals, or we can say the unique producers. There is a cyclotron facility installed there. Uh, there are also uh, cameras installed to make also clinical work. And nowadays, besides the production of radio pharmaceuticals and the research and development activities in the field. I think ICNAS is also involved in 30, more than 30 clinical trials in support of the development of uh, uh, drugs, not radioactive drugs, using the radioactive, as you will explain, radioactive compounds to foster, to speed up the development of, uh, of pharmaceuticals. So I think in this, uh, uh, presentation and there will then, I believe, will make an, an overview of the know how expertise of himself and Dignes uh, in the field with the, the, the presentation on tackle molecular imaging and translational research from molecules to men. So, Anter, please, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Antonio, for the kind presentation. As Antonio mentioned, uh, we are friends and collaborators of many years, and uh, Antonio is not officially part of uh, ICNAS, but is a big supporter and main collaborator from the beginning. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I'll try to share my screen okay my idea today and we can make this as interactive as as you wish okay is to give you an overview of how molecular imaging can be used as a tool to translate from basic fundamental science to clinical application actually i will try to explain that from my point of view molecular imaging is the tool for translational research. And this is why we think this whole um, field is the most exciting and uh, uh, for sure one of the uh, the ones with the, with the most promising future because we think that this could really change the way we do science. And 
you can interrupt any time and we can make this, um, you know, if you want to focus on any specific aspect. Uh, I was telling the, the colleagues yesterday I could give this talk for half an hour or for five hours and they prefer half an hour, that's fine. Uh, but if there is any specific topic you want to discuss, I'm very willing to, to focus on that. Anyway, um, as, as Antonio was saying, Coimbra is the ancient capital of Portugal, the first one. Uh, our first uh, five kings were born here, and the, when they moved to Lisbon, there was an empty castle here in Coimbra, so they said, well, let's start the university. That was in 1290, okay? So the university is more than 700 years old. It's a beautiful city, it's a world heritage site, if you have the chance, you can uh, come, discuss science and uh, enjoy some uh, um, Portuguese hospitality, if you wish. Anyway, um, so we do three things from uh, uh, molecules to men, as I say in my presentation. So we have a strong chemistry group that uh, basically focus on producing and developing radio pharmaceuticals and uh, this is the field that we have a strong collaboration with Antonio's group that is uh, that has been working in this field for many more years than than we have so we have, they have great experience it's a fantastic group uh, so we have chemistry then we have Preclinical studies with the uh, uh, PET, MR, photoacoustic tomography, optical imaging, fluorescence, bioluminescence, etc. And then we have the clinical part in which we have two PET CT scanners and the three Tesla MRI and uh, a strong, very strong collaboration with industry in the drug developing process. So, so not just developing radio pharmaceuticals, actually supporting the, the the industry in developing new drugs. As uh, Antonio was mentioning, we're currently participating in 35 clinical trials with the industry. Okay, so these two keywords, molecular imaging and translational research, are the essential ones for my talk today. Why? Because um, in the bio biomedical research field, okay, you really have two completely opposite sides. Okay, it looks like we are, I don't know, from different worlds. On one side, you have what we call the basic um, laboratory researchers, you know, chemists, biochemists, uh, biologists that work with animal models, they work with tissues, they do it with cells, they work with immobilized proteins, and they are looking at um, the mechanisms, the fundamental, the underlying mechanisms of disease. And they discovered interesting things every day. They discovered a certain protein or a receptor that if it's activated or inactivated might play a role in that disease and could constitute a molecular target for therapy. And they wonder, okay, they publish a very nice paper and they wonder if that will one day be used across the pond in the in the in the clinical field and in the clinical field, clinical field you have clinicians they look at patients they look at uh, uh, lots of data and actually they are big consumers of and producers of big data okay and they are looking at all this data that they collect from the patients and they try to relate that with the the papers they read from the basic fundamental scientists that are publishing and the problem is that these two things they don't match OK, uh, actually, there was a very famous paper on nature. I'm sure we all know about it that called this the great value of death. That means you develop something very interesting that looks very promising at basic fundamental research in the bench. OK, and when we want to move to the clinical side, it all collapses. So uh, the majority of the projects, more than 90 percent of the projects that are developed from the labs, they fail, they don't translate into the clinical application. And uh, um, where, what I think is the key, well, it's not just me, we, we, um, there's a lot of people starting to think like that, uh, is that um, the translation between basic fundamental science and clinical application is molecular imaging. Why? Because if I am doing, for example, a PET scan, 
okay, with the radiopharmaceutical in a patient, okay. I'm looking at interaction between a tracer and the receptor, an enzyme, a transporter, some molecule, okay, and I'm actually looking at exactly the same process using very similar tools that the biochemist is using in the in in the in the laboratory, okay, in the in the cells or animal mo models or immobilized enzyme, okay. So basically, we can translate directly the research from basic and fundamental science into clinical application and this is a very very important tool okay uh, uh, today i'm going to focus on pet because pet is the technology i use it's the technology i know better and if you ask me i think pet is the best molecular imaging technology is it the only one? No, of course not. OK, MRI has improved dramatically in recent years. And of course, you have variations of MRI that are functional, like, for example, MRS, like fMRI, etc. And then, you, of course, you have SPECT and you have optical imaging, fluorescence and bioluminescence. And of course, we have some new technology, which recently installed here a photoacoustic tomography device. This is something that excites with a pulsated laser light and then reads out um, uh, ultrasound. So it's a mix between two technologies. All of these are like building blocks, okay, for this bridge between basic fundamental science and clinical application. So molecular imaging is the key, is the ultimate translational tool, okay? Now, all the, these technologies I've been talking about, PET, SPEC, MR, etc., okay, CT, uh, echography, they uh, all provide different sources of information. Depends on what you want to see. If you want to see structure, then you will see T, MRI or ultrasound. If you want to look f physiology, then uh, PET, SPEC and MRS are more interesting, etc. But if you really want to define details, the molecular interactions that are the subject of study in the bench, then you need PET. Sometimes you can get away with SPECT, but most of the time you need PET. Now, techniques have advantages and disadvantages. I'm sorry, I, I'm giving the basics, okay? I, I'm pretty sure you all know these, but I don't mind starting the story from the beginning. Okay, so um, uh, anatomical uh, imaging has better spatial resolution. Our 9.4 Tesla preclinical MR is 30 micrometers spatial resolution. You cannot get that with PET. Okay, it's impossible. So spatial resolution is better on the on the uh, on the anatomical techniques, but then sensitivity it's better on the, on the um, molecular imaging uh, radioisotopic techniques such as PET, for example. In PET, we can actually uh, use nano to picomolar that's 10 to the minus 9 to the 10 to the minus 12 molar of our tracer to be able to get an image so we are extremely sensitive and because of that then the pharmaceutical industry recognizing that has created a new phase in the developing of a new drug so we all know about preclinical development and then phase clinical trials, phase one, two, three with the vaccine, it's clinical trials everywhere. Everybody is an expert on clinical trials everywhere. What you don't hear about is uh, that there is a new phase between preclinical development and the clinical trials and it's called phase zero, okay? What is phase zero? Phase zero as defined by the pharmacy uh, regulators is a, uh, uh, access to human studies with a very low amount of their compounds. They say that to be called a microdosing study, the maximum you can inject in a patient is 1% of the expected therapeutic dose. Well, as I mentioned before, in PET, we use nano to picomolar. So we're not at 1%. We are 0.000001%. Okay. So um, radio pharmaceuticals are perfect for this concept of microdosing. And actually, the new clinical trial regulations that are coming into force probably this year, early next year in Europe, will actually exempt diagnostic radio pharmaceuticals for most of the requirements that you need to start the clinical trial because of these microdosing uh, studies. And what can you get from it? Well, you can get a lot. 
Let's imagine that you have a tracer that was very promising in the preclinical development and you want to know if this will work in men. Then you can use it as a radio pharmaceutical, your radio label. You put into men and you get the basic pharmacokinetic parameters. Does it cross the relevant barriers, for example, the blood brain barrier? Does it access the molecular target? Does it concentrate where I expect to concentrate? What is the blood kinetics? Is it uh, fast clearance, low clearance? Is it uh, through the um, through the bladder? Is it through the hepo uh, hepatobiliary uh, pathway? So you get the main pharmacokinetic parameters from it. So you can actually use this as a tool to decide which compounds are more likely to be successful. And then you only pursue the clinical trials with the most promising compounds. And this is considered to be an important factor in speeding up drug trials and focus them on the most efficient compounds. Sometimes you reach phase two and then you discover that you have poor pharmacokinetics, your metabolism is the disaster and it's it's a big mess. So the industry is very keen on this and this is a big opportunity. Anyway, I put some references if you want. In the end, if you want, I can send it to you if you need. OK, to do that, you need quite a large facility. OK. Um, we have three floors, each one dedicated to a different um, a step on the, on the translational approach. And the uh, uh, floor minus two, so two floors below ground, is um, the production, so chemistry. Okay, Production is, of course, GMP, it has to be, because what we do, we inject into patients. Okay, And we currently have a um, bunker with two psychotrons. The initial psychotron was installed when ICNAS started about 10 years ago, and it's an IVA 18.9. That means it can accelerate protons to 18 million electron volts and deuterons to 9 million electron volts. And the most interesting isotopes we produced from the beginning was F18. As you all know, F18 is the blockbuster of, of PET uh, for two very interesting reasons that I don't know if you are aware of. First of all, um, F18 has a very nice half-life of uh, about 110 minutes, so about two hours. That means you can produce during the night and then distribute, okay? And the second one is that F18 is actually an excellent substituent of hydrogen. And if there is something that is common in organic molecules, as we all know, more common even than carbon, it's hydrogen. So the, the, the bond length CH is very close to the CF, okay? The van der Waals radius is very similar. So basically, um, it's, it's an excellent radio labeling strategy uh, using uh, uh, fluorine. So, of course, F18 is a blockbuster. Then, of course, we have carbon 11. Carbon 11 with 20 minute half life is a bit on the short side, but then, of course, all organic molecules by definition have carbon in their composition so it's always nice to use carbon we are producing more than 10 compounds based on on carbon it's very interesting uh, isotope and of course we have oxygen 15. the problem with ox oxygen 15 is that with 122 seconds half-life it's very difficult to work with it it's too short uh, better than, F uh, than oxygen-15, we have N13. N13 we use to produce ammonia for myocardial perfusion scans. It's about 10 minute half-life and it's uh, a good balance between fast uh, uh, blood kinetics and fast um, diffusion into tissue and uh, um, not too long half-life. Okay, but this, this is where we started, you know, the, the, the basic um, research in PET is uh, based around small molecules, small organic molecules around carbon, nitrogen, fluorine, etc. Well, this is changing. This is changing and we are doing a lot recently uh, with radiometals. So the concept of having a, a bifunctional chelator in which you attach to a molecule, a biological molecule with some affinity for some receptor trans or transporter or whatever. And then on the other side, 
you have a chelator for a radio metal. It's a very interesting approach, okay? And uh, we started with gallon 68 and then moved to copper 61, copper 64, but we had a problem. As I mentioned, our cyclotron was an 18 MeV proton machine. And for some of these reactions, you don't need 18, you need 12, others you need 14. So we have a problem. When you purchase the cyclotron, you need to decide what energy the cyclotron is, and sometimes the energy is not the right one. So we challenged the cyclotron manufacturer and started a project with them. And the result of that project is this cyclotron that was installed here in 2019, was the first in the world of its kind. And with this cyclotron, you can actually extract the beam at different energies. OK, so um, because of that, we can actually extract any energy between 12 and 18 MeV. We open up a series of either isotopes. We optimize the production of gallium 68. This is why we have the patent. We optimize the production of copper 61, copper 64, start producing zircon 89, scanning 44, and many other isotopes. So this completely opened up the uh, possibilities, and we are very excited, uh, especially these metal chelators coupled with some smart uh, chelation chemistry, uh, most of it that we are collaborating with Antonio and this fantastic group is actually changing the way we look at this field. We will talk a, a little bit more about this later. Okay, so then we have a lot of uh, chemistry labs, three parallel labs and a lot of automation that basically we press the button and they do all the work for us. So it's uh, um, quite um, extensive, uh, quite extensive labs. Uh, we also have, of course, QC and sterility and set of the normal stuff. Anyway, one floor up, we have the clinical imaging. For the clinical imaging, as I mentioned, we have two PET CT scanners, and we also have lab laboratories for cell culture by distribution. And we are working on specific um, uh, scanners developed by our team. For example, a, a typical uh, clinical scanner will have like uh, five, six millimeter resolution. We just finished the tender to purchase a brand new digital PET uh, system as a special resolution of about three millimeters, but uh, we think that's not enough. So we are working on a high resolution brain PET system that will achieve sub millimeter resolution. So the idea is to look at uh, uh, even more detailed processes in the human brain. So we're also quite excited about it and uh, um, we we'll, should have results by the end of this year if everything, everything goes okay. So okay, the clinical imaging is GCP certified, so good clinical practices. And uh, last but not least, the preclinical research um, is GLP uh, certified, of course, also. Uh, also on the preclinical, we have a 9.4 Tesla MR machine for rats and mice, uh, but we also work on developing of new systems, and this is a high resolution, small animal brain pet with 0 0.3 millimeter resolution. This is a scan with Raclopride. This is a dopaminergic D2 antagonist. And what you're seeing that it is a striatum of a uh, mouse, okay, superimposed on a uh, mouse MR, okay. So uh, in the human side we do PET CT, on the animal side we do PET MR. It's better suited for small animals. Anyway, um, talking about a bit about the basics, okay. This is the basic fundamentals of medical imaging. Again, I apologize for saying what everybody knows, but I think it's nice to touch base if you allow me. OK, so molecular imaging is an approach in which we start with a question. It can be a clinical question. For example, a clinician in an hospital comes to us and say, I want to diagnose this pathology that I don't have any other way to do it. Or it can be a research question. It can be, I think that this specific mechanism is involved in this disease and I want um, uh, 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 an imaging biomarker that can prove or disprove my theory. OK, from that we answer with a molecule. OK, and then we need to answer three questions. What is your molecular target? What kind of enzyme, enzyme transporter, receptor is changed 
in your model, okay, in your disease, then you need to select a tracer molecule that has affinity and selectivity for that process, and then you attach it to the nucleide. It's super easy, okay? If that goes well, you do an image and you answer the question. If that doesn't go well, you call it research, publish a nice paper and start over again. So it's good fun. I think it's the most fantastic field in the world, but then everybody has this favorite subject. And I would like to go through each one of these um, areas with you and start talking about what kind, for example, of molecular targets we can have. OK, three main clinical areas of application. First of all, oncology, of course because of the importance of the problem. Now we are all worried about the pandemic, but of course, when we are not worrying about the pandemic, we are worrying about oncology, okay? We can look, for example, at very simple tracers that target the blood tissue interaction. You can look at changes in blood. You can look at endothelium integrity, okay? That is, you know, the, the um, endothelium of, this, uh, uh, of the capillary gets stretched next to the tumor and opens gaps that you can explore to pass the molecules around. You can look at uh, cell death, either necrosis or apoptosis. You can look at hypoxia, as you know, is an important factor in many solid tumors. You can look at inflammation and angiogenesis, all of these are areas in which we at thickness are working. So we have tracers for all of this process. Now, if you zoom in one single cell, then you can look at metabolic pathways. You can label drugs and test them before you treat the patients with them. You can look at receptor ligands. Of course, it's a very, very important uh, field. You can uh, look at membrane synthesis, for example, with choline that will tell you if the uh, membrane is synthesizing uh, phospholipids like ph phosphatidylcholine. You can look at protein synthesis with methionine, for example. Uh, you can uh, use S phase markers that look at cells that are replicating uh, DNA, and you can look at gene expression. So basically, uh, this is these are also areas in which we are working and that we have traces for it. Second big important field is neuroscience. OK, actually, in PET, there are more traces developed for neuroscience than for um, than for um, oncology. Uh, there is a huge interest from the neuroscientists, both neurologists and um, um, psychiatrists, on uh, imaging, both MR and, and PET, and they are a big driving force behind what we do. If you look at the dopaminergic synapse, we have FDOPA as dopamine precursor to look at presynaptic function. You have lacroplide, as I mentioned before, to look at dopaminergic D2 postsynaptic receptors. You have these methyls sharing 23-390 for dopaminergic D1. You can look at the dopamine reuptake site, the dopamine transporter with this uh, beta CIT, etc. Many other traces. Also, we can look at inflammation with this PK995 marker. It's a, a marker of the TSPO receptors. You can look at brain amyloid deposits with PIB. You can look at monoamine oxidizes. And you can even see very, very fine and detailed processes. For example, we are using this tracer, copper 64 ATSM, to look at mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, that results from uh, oxidative stress that happens in the beginning of the uh, neuro uh, degenerative, degenerative diseases. So in the beginning of Parkinson, in the beginning of Alzheimer, in the beginning of Huntington's, you start to have cells that are in stress that created excess of reactive um, species, uh, free radicals, and, and as a consequence of that, you have a mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, you can look at that with, with these stresses, the COP ATSM. So we're really looking at the beginning, okay, of, of uh, neurodegenerative disease. Of course, if you want to develop, for example, um, um, uh, um, uh, a drug that will target these early processes, then you can use these tools to evaluate it. And then, of course, last but not least, cardiology. As you know, 
uh, I'm actually, uh, I think Antonio said that, I'm actually a biochemist, so I like these diagrams, but I, I will not get too much into it. Just to say that, as you know, the um, myocardium is uh, by fuel, is a hybrid vehicle, as we say today. It can work with the glucose, it can work with fatty acids, and we can do image both ways. And actually, uh, to stop the big discussion, okay, at which fed state the patient is, that is a big discussion between um, technologists and doctors all the time when we do cardiology. Now we decided to put a stop on it all and go straight to the, the Krebs cycle, okay? So now we're using acetate to image the heart. That is irresp irrespectively if the patient uh, is in fed or fast state, we don't care. We go straight to the Krebs cycle and see metabolism directly looking at the acetylcoenzyme A. So, okay, this is uh, what we're doing at the moment. Of course, cardiology is two sides. You have the heart and last but not least, you have the cardiovascular component, okay? And in the cardiovascular component, you can look at the vulnerability of the plaque. We are publishing um, a lot in this field using a very simple tracer. Actually, it's the oldest PET tracer. It's sodium fluoride. It's actually, we call it the juice from the cyclotron, okay? It basically comes straight from the cyclotron. We just do a QMA filtration, put it straight into sterile saline and go straight to the pay. Well, after the quality control, of course, but then not much can go wrong. And this tells you if there is an active calcification process in a certain plaque because one thing is to have plaque and most of us uh, if we have a certain age and i don't know uh, food in portugal is quite good so we, we got lost sometimes at the table uh, everybody at a certain age will have plaque it's a big difference to just have plaque or to have vulnerable plaque so plaque that is unstable that will detach and then circulate until they form somehow a block in the brain in the heart or in the in the lungs as you know and this could be a catastrophic event okay so this is a very simple and very effective tool and many others i don't want to wait to take too much time from you if you want to if you are interested in any of these write to me my email is on the first page and um, we can talk about it okay so, uh, as Antonio mentioned, we are also the, the main supplier of uh, radio pharmaceuticals in Portugal. Uh, we produce during the night to distribute during the day. Uh, and uh, um, I was looking at production in the first six years. We started in 2012. And of course, we sell a lot of FDG. You know, it's like our bread and butter. Everybody uh, uses FDG, it's good for any cancer. But then um, the, uh, the F18 is the red line. We started to notice, okay, we started uh, producing um, Gallium 68 Dotanoc. This is a somatostatin analog for neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, uh, this was a challenge by the local Coimbra University Hospital. And they said, well, we need to some Gallium 68 because we have these um, neuro neuroendocrine tumor patients and we want to image them. And I said, well, uh, neuroendocrine, that's a quite rare cancer. How many do you get per week? And he said, well, we get like one per week um, in the hospital. And I said, okay, I purchased the gallium generator and we started to do some scans with the somatostatic analog. And as you can see here, this is not number of patients. This is number of production cycles. Each production cycle is many patients. And you see here that in 2018, I was already doing 400 productions of Dotanoc, rare cancer, and 500 of 17 of FDG, all cancers. So it's a bit strange. And then uh, in 2015, we also start uh, labeling these uh, prostate, um, well, they call it prostate specific membrane antigen. It's not prostate specific. Uh, but anyway, it's the name they gave it. It's a receptor that is overexpressed in prostate cancer in many other tissues. But anyway, we started doing imaging with them. And then, as you see here, the blue uh, sky um, is rocketing, okay? And uh, I'm now producing more gallium 68 
productions than FTG. That is incredibly strange. So we start looking at it. Um, I don't want to make to take too much of your time because they give me 40 minutes. It's almost over. But anyway, um, we start looking at Galen 68, and Galen 68 is the worst of every possible nuclide. It has a short half-life, 68 minutes. It's not a pure positron emitter. The average beta energy is too high. That means the images are not very high quality and it's a big mess. But anyway, the key to Galen 68 is this big buzzword, Terranostics, okay? And what is this Terranostics? Well, Terranostics is the capacity to uh, have in the same molecule the diagnostic and the therapeutic capacity. How do you do that? Well, let's say that you take Dotanoc, for example, that I was showing in the previous slide. Dotanoc, as I mentioned, is a somatostatin analog and the, it binds to certain uh, somatostatic receptors that are overexpressed in um, uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So what I do is that I do an ice image with Galen 68 Dotanoc and after I switch the Galen 68 positron emitter by lutetium 177. Now lutetium 177 is a beta minus emitter. Beta minus means that it emits high speed electrons. So basically I use the Galen image to calibrate my therapeutics. This is why we call it Terranostics, is a combination of diagnostic and therapy. OK, and basically this means that I can adapt the therapy to each patient. OK, it's linked with the idea of personalized medicine and so on. And this is, of course, being very um, source of big interest. OK, to be honest, for us working in nuclear medicine, this is nothing new. We've been doing, um, uh, sorry, Iudin uh, 123 and 131 since 1941 actually last month the iodine uh, 131 therapy made 80 years old but anyway um, now they call it this fancy name terranostics but the most important thing is that this is causing an impact in the clinical practice the first terranostic modern uh, clinical trial done by a spin-off from cern called uh, aaa um, was, I, I think you can see here, the Kentel and Meyer curves showed such a big impact on late stage neuroendocrine tumor patients that Novartis, the big pharmaceutical company, purchased them by 3.9 billion euros, okay? Now, uh, until that point, I have never witnessed some pharmaceutical companies spend so much time, so, so much money, sorry, on a radio pharmaceutical. So um, there must be something about it. And then after an American company called Endocyte did a version also of the prostate specific, that is not specific membrane antigen with lutetium also with striking evidence. And then Novartis purchased them by $2.1 billion dollars. OK, so you can imagine the interest. OK, anyway, this is now uh, quite a big field. Uh, actually, this lutetium PSMA was recently approved in, in the US last week. So there is a big buzz about it. And we think that this kind of approach will replicate in the future. OK, I will not take too much time with these and I will not take too much time explaining our patents on the Galen production because it's too boring and I don't have enough time, and then Antonio will kill my talk and explain. I will not also explain how we can extract different beams from a cyclotron. Uh, this is because I'm a biochemist, not a physicist, and I don't really have uh, that much knowledge. Anyway, uh, just to show you uh, one chart, that is this one. Um, we don't think that Galen 68 is the future. We think that copper 61 is the future, and the reason for it is because of something that we never show on the scientific papers, but it's very important, that is money. OK, so here you have some of the most common radioisotopes for PET that I talked about in my presentation. And here in the last column, you have the price. So if you like, for example, um, to produce Galen 68, 
then you need to pay about 1,700 euros per each gram of zinc 68. If you like copper 64, then you need to pay 31,000 euros per gram to purchase nickel 64. But we developed a process to produce copper 61 from natural zinc. Okay, that costs 30 cents of an euro per gram. So it's a huge difference on it. Okay, so we really think that copper 61, very nice half life, 3.3 hours, short energy range. So really, really happy about it. Anyway, this is the timeline of our production. I don't want to waste too much time about it. This is a photograph of our first box of FTG, 16th of January 2012. Okay, and the big problem is that because we said to people that we will be producing during the night, we only get men. It was a very, very boring place. People just talk about football and it was not a pleasant place to work. Um, this is the first label. It was for Lisbon, the hospital, and um, it was uh, all the products that we produce here are from our research. And um, this is in 2018, much better with a much more, much more balanced uh, team now uh, with the gender um, uh, equilibrium. Uh, quite, quite nice, of course, and already five products on the market. And this is the inauguration of the new cyclotron in 2019 with a much wider group. At the moment, I have more than 100 people working with me here, so it's quite nice to to work. And of course, with a much more balanced eye, I have girls at one in the morning running the cyclotron. OK, and uh, so Quimber is one of the safest places in the world. It's an academic city, so anyway. It's a good, good place to live. And uh, this was my short tour of ICNES, okay? Just to acknowledge our big important collaborations with IAEA. I'm also an expert for uh, the European Pharmacopeia, ENM, the local hospitals, and of course the uh, EIST, that is um, uh, Antonius University in Lisbon. And of course, a big pleasure to collaborate with them all. Thank you very much. I don't know if this was too long, Antonio. Not at all. Congratulations, Antonio. It was just in time, and I think it was a very comprehensive and excellent overview of ICNIS activities and contribution using molecular imaging modalities to develop drugs and to develop radio pharmaceuticals. I think it was what really we wanted for a, a broad audience. Congratulations again. So. I think we have really time for uh, some questions. Please, anyone, feel free to post questions to Antero. Uh, I can start if I can. Emiliano speaking. Hi, Antero. Yes, yes. I can speak uh, as usual. Congratulations. I yeah, have a question regarding what, what is your vision about uh, uh, antibodies and uh, antibodies fragment uh, in the next future of uh, nuclear medicine? Uh, it's a very, very interesting question. Actually, you see a shift uh, from my view. I think you see uh, nuclear medicine coming back to, to, to basics. OK, we started and Antonio knows it very well uh, with technician and uh, with the uh, radio labeling of uh, biologicals with technician and, and other uh, metals, indium and etc. And uh, now with PET, you see a big, um, a big coming back to that. Um, antibodies uh, have the selectivity, okay, to to be the perfect molecules for for PET. Uh, of course, uh, antibodies have a drawback that is they have long circulating times, and because of that, that means high dose to the patient, and you need to work with long-lived nuclides such as zirconium that you know very well. Um, we are switching. Now here, uh, the research from uh, the full um, antibodies into the smaller fractions, uh, nanobodies and uh, um, fragments that retain the affinity for the target, but at the same time, they don't have the long kinetics, okay, that, that will uh, make 
the image uh, less interesting. Um, so we are working now with a series of uh, um, um, fast uh, kinetic uh, nanobodies. Uh, we started using uh, natural ones from um, uh, some animals that we know that they have short uh, nanobodies, like for example the camelids. Actually, two uh, animals in the animal kingdom have short. The shortest uh, antibodies is uh, camels and sharks. Okay, and for some reasons, people prefer to work with the camels. They look a bit more tame. Okay, um, but as I said, we we switched to uh, synthetic nanobodies, and we've been having very very interesting results with them. So I think this will be a fantastic field for the future, and also because of the terranostic approach, I'm sure this will change a lot of what we're doing today. I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. OK, some more questions to Antel. Sometime, if, sometime. if not, if not, I have one. Mario from Polymi. Thank you, uh, Antonio, and thank you, Antero, for uh, your uh, very impressive presentation from a scientific point of view, and also very nice from a graphic point of view. Very, very nice. Uh, the first is a curiosity, probably uh, useful for our colleagues from Cancer Center and the hospitals in Italy. Uh, how much does it cost <laughs> the cyclotron you have uh, since uh, 2019? Okay, I, I, I'm not involved in the commercial part of the cyclotron, of course. Uh, we just purchased the machine. Actually, it was a research project with IBA. So, because it was the first IBA cyclotron with variable energy, they they basically just charged for the parts. It was a joint process. Okay, I don't know how, how much it costs, but to be honest, I don't think considering what you can do with it. Okay, and there are other options in the market, other manufacturers. Okay, that are also uh, producing now uh, variable energy cyclotrons. I think it's certainly worth the investment. Okay. Yes, it's, it's a phenomenal machine, and and all of this opportunity to use these um, radio pharmaceuticals to help to develop new um, uh, new drugs is huge. I'll give you an example. For example, uh, we um, we are using PIB for amyloid uh, Alzheimer scans, okay, and we did more than 800 PIB scans. And uh, uh, if you diagnose Alzheimer, but then you go to the patients and say, well, you have Alzheimer, but there is not much we can do. There is no cure for Alzheimer. Now there is a new therapy that uh, incidentally, uh, it was one of our clinical trials here with, with that molecule. There is a, a, a potential amyloid uh, targeting molecule that was uh, released uh, a couple of weeks ago. But you don't, you cannot do much, okay? But you can use these tools to help develop the new generation of of uh, of uh, drugs, okay? So I think this is a pet. It's much more important as a drug development tool, okay? I'm not saying it's not important for clinical application. Of course, they will always be doing clinical scans, and it's it's a phenomenal technique, and for many areas. Uh, in oncology and cardiology and neuroscience is the gold standard. But I'm just saying it's a much more interesting tool, even more for research. OK, and uh, uh, so in the end, uh, I, I give you an example. Our initial cyclotron, that one we purchased, was about 1.2 million euros. OK, mm -hmm. the three Tesla MRI machine was 4 million. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you think PET is expensive, try MRI. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Honestly. Okay. So uh, I think accusing us of being expensive is is not the right way to, to place it. Okay. You need to see the value 
that you take out of having such a powerful tool in your hand, okay? And the pet is a phenomenal. And you see many people, for example, uh, I did my, my PhD, as Antonio was saying, in London at the Hammersmith Hospital. And at the time, a lot of the neurologists were actually um, moving from PET to MR, you know, and they said MR is the future, better resolution. And then you see them 20 years later coming back to PET saying MR was a hoax. Uh, we never know what we're looking at. PET is quantitative, PET is the reference. And now everybody's coming back. So uh, we just say, OK, welcome back. Enjoy the ride and let's go. You know, we're, we're doing fantastic things in neuroscience. For example, we are we're working with the um, uh, King's College in, 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 a, in a tracer that is called UCBJ, that we are looking at a brain synaptic density. Something that a few years ago you thought you will do with MR, but actually it turns out that uh, PET is the best technology for it. OK, so um, I know like the, the copper TSM I was mentioning before, looking at uh, the very beginning of neurodegenerative diseases. So actually you are you, you, you really have some really very, very, very good tools to um, to to use. And of course, uh, these tools will make an impact in research. And you see the interest, take the industry, okay, take an interest. I mean, uh, I, I never expected to have a major company like um, Novartis spending six billion on basic two pet research uh, companies, okay, like uh, AAA and Enosite. And if they are at it, it's because they consider this to be mainstream. So I think this was like the pet technology that was born, as you know, in the late 70s, coming of age. OK, it's like uh, hitting mainstream. And to be honest, we're getting so much interest from the industry. OK, we have contracts with uh, uh, not only Novartis, AstraZeneca, uh, Roche and uh, BioNTech, you know, the, they, they are full of money because of the vaccine and they signed with us two, week, two weeks ago. Um, they want to start a trial because their interest of all these uh, companies that are exploring the mRNA vaccines, their interest was never virus. The interest was oncology. They want to cure cancer. OK, and uh, they are planning on using uh, molecular imaging to validate the, the their research. So it's really it's it's a research tool. OK, nothing against doing clinics. It's of course we'll always do clinics, but it's a phenomenal research tool. And uh, we're just joined the uh, uh, Eurobioimaging. That is a big European infrastructure. They have people from microscopy to optical imaging to everything and um, they were very keen in, you know, in us joining because we are a, uh, a pet center, OK? And suddenly uh, pet centers are a big source of interest for for all research, you know, L elucidating the mechanisms of disease, looking at the kinetics of new drugs, um, doing, as I mentioned before, the translation of projects from the bench to, to the clinic, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, I think it's a fantastic feel. And it's it's fantastic to see it, you know, as a researcher, working this field for many years. And many times you say, I work in radio chemistry, and people say, radio what? OK, and then suddenly, OK, I don't think we are the strange people in the corner. Now I think we are in many aspects taking a, a central role, role in many areas. And just in Alzheimer, I have three trials running. OK, uh, I have trials in Parkinson's, many trials in cancer, of course, and uh, it's really exciting times. And also, as I mentioned, I think as I was talking with, I was mentioning to Emiliano Casola, is that you see PET coming back to the basics, OK, coming back to the and nuclear medicine, coming back to the biologicals, you know, peptides and uh, antibodies. Also coming back in terms of technology, because people move to crystals for pet technology and a lot of the pet technology, almost all pet technology today is based on crystals. But then we have high resolution with the uh, with the sandwich 
detectors, these high-resolution systems we are building is wire chambers. You know, now wire chambers is what people used before crystals, you know. So it's it, it's really coming back. It's it's quite it's it's fantastic. So we are super excited, and we think, of course, I mean everybody thinks the the field they work is the best in the world. Okay, sorry, it's <laughs> same with everybody. But uh, I really feel that I, I think it's really really exciting times, and I think I don't know Antonio and Emiliano and all the others probably have the same idea. I think I'm not, I don't know. Maybe it's anyway, a, you you you. You did a very good work and you are lucky to have that kind of machine, in my opinion. And well, thank you, another, thank another, you for your kind words, Mario. <laughs> another question, I, I don't know if uh, can can uh, has a sense, but I have seen different radionuclides with uh, different branching ratio uh, in comparison uh, between, uh, for example, electron capture or uh, beta plus emission. Um, for example, copper 64 and uh, zirconium 89 has, have uh, a very uh, little uh, beta plus emission. Uh, how this kind of uh, branching can affect, uh, for example, the measurements or uh, the dose uh, to the patient? Uh, it's, it's an important question, is that uh, um, traditional PET nuclides, you know, like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and, and fluorine, they suffer from this short half-life problem, okay? And of course, people, especially as they move to biologicals, they want longer half-lives. And the two most promising nuclides at the moment is, of course, uh, copper 64 with 12.7 hours half-life and, and zirconium 89 with 3.3 days. Uh, the the, the the concern about those in the patient is not just about the half-life of the radionuclide, okay? It's, it's of course related with the biological half-life of the compound you're labeling. So if your compound has fast kinetics, then it's not really a big problem. So for example, we are labeling our uh, nanobodies with, with zirconium too, just because we have great tools to label with zirconium and it makes sense, okay? Um, the the question of which nuclide will be the most interesting for the future okay uh it's a big question um uh, there's a lot of people some big friends i have in italy that have a strong um interest in copper 64 uh it has um also antonio's group we have been working with copper 64 for several years with with good results as a nice half-life 12.7 hours is only 17 percent positron emitter but it's enough for what we want to see and the dosimetry is not unfavorable okay this is another thing that is changing because in the past people were thinking mr is good no radiation pet is bad radiation well Actually, most studies have proven that uh, small doses of radiation have little or no effect. Okay, the body is well uh, suited to handle radiation like all living beings. And um, today, I don't think there is a concern that existed some years ago uh, that is so much regarding dosimetry. Okay. Uh, in the diagnostic component of course therapy is a completely different issue naturally okay so uh, i don't think there is uh, that much of a concern and of course there is also the practical the the practical the the practicality sorry of uh, the longer lived nuclides that you can produce and distribute okay for example we distribute gallium 68 tracers and it's uh, madness because with 68 minute half-life uh, you know, distributing to Lisbon that is two hours away, uh, it's a challenge, you know, you we have to produce four times more to, to reach the hospitals. So having something like Copper 64 or Zircon 99 will be much better in terms of the logistics. Okay. okay. So I think Thank you. We, Thank we, you. It's now 2 p.m. in Lisbon, 3 p.m. in Milan. Elaine, I don't know, should we close the session now and the people can through the chat and send questions to Enter? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah? So probably we'll uh, finish now our webinar. I, I would like to thank again 
Antero for the very nice presentation. I think it was really a very good thing for the webinar cycles.